conference will now be recorded. Les Downs will be on virtual, guys, tonight. Les will be on virtual, guys. Hi. <coughs> Call the Planning and Zoning and Variance Commission regular session agenda April 12, 2022, 5.30. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Armino. Present. Booker. Here. Navarro. Here. Norris. Spain. Here, sir. Leon. Here. Public comments. Do we have any? Victor? No. No public comments? Unless there's somebody online. Nobody online for public comments? Okay. Move on. Approval of minutes of February 8, 2022. If there's no Omissions or corrections? Can I have a motion? I'll move that we approve them. Have a motion and a second. Roll call. Armijo? Yes. Coker? Stay. Moderano? Yes. And S Spain? Yes, sir. Leone? Yes. Sorry, I'm confused. Okay, we're going to no move the Muriel application <coughs> to five and the root policy housing needs assessment to six. So, mural application should not use mural program. Staff. has been submitted by Eileen Riling on behalf of Trinidad Youth Mural Program and proposes to paint a mural on the retaining wall of the Waterworks Building on West Cedar Street. The mural materials will include concrete, primer, exterior house paint, and anti-graffiti top coat. The mural was designed by and would be painted by students involved in the Trinidad Youth Mural Program, started in 2021. The mural is intended to activate and space the space and celebrate local recreational activities, wildlife, and environment. The project will take place over a two-month summer break between June 1st and July 31st to accommodate the schedules of six high school and college students involved. The property is owned by the City of Trinidad and the Waterworks Building on the property and will be the future home of Trinidad's Office of Outdoor Recreation. The mural will be facing north towards the Waterworks Building and is visible from the Riverwalk Trail and from the Waterworks Building. Uh, there's included in this staff report is uh, First Amendment considerations regarding the regulation of artwork. 
And uh, Cong it says, uh, text to First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Um, Mr. Chairman, could I interrupt, please? Yes, go ahead. And I'm, I'm very sorry. For the record, this is Les Down City Attorney. And I, I just want to say, there is, and I'm so sorry for interrupting Ms. Hall, but there are a lot of things that are contained in the staff report that I think are additional and extra information rather than what the commission needs. I, I want to just let you know that everybody wanted to have this commission involved in the whole mural process, especially for murals as they normally exist, like a uh, mural proposal on the side of a building, and we want to have a lot of uh, a lot of review, especially if it's in the historic preservation uh, portion of downtown. Um, in any event, this is a much simpler mural application because it is a proposal just to have these kids put a series of murals on a retaining wall, as Ms. Hall was saying, just adjacent to the Waterworks building. I don't think it is going to require a great deal of heartburn or analysis by this commission. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah. I think really is a straightforward application. I think it's a very good thing. Your normal role in the mural process is to look at like the dimensions of a proposed mural, where it's going to go, to make sure that it complies with um, provisions of the sign code as they may apply to, to murals. And it really is more the physical dimensions of a mural application that you consider. And because this is just going on the, the um, side of or on a retaining wall to kind of beautify that area, I don't think it's really a very controversial or difficult application for your consideration. Again, if that makes sense. Yes, sir. It does. I think it makes sense, yes. Good. And so I'll, I'll mute myself now. I just think that um, the application of the staff report kind of speak for themselves. Um, and, it, you know, if you, if you approve this and it's done, you know, everybody approves, it would really be a benefit to that retaining wall in that area. But anyway, I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting. I just wanted to be able to abbreviate this process if I could. I, you know, again, if you have any questions or anything you want to discuss with your staff, I don't mean to get in the way of that. I just think this is a pretty straightforward application. And really the whole First Amendment conversation, that's if the mural had content or had things that um, you had to consider um, for that, but that wouldn't really be in front of this commission anyway. Your, your role is more for the, the dimensions and the, the, the quality of the workmanship, not the art or the content. Um. There, is a there is a picture of the artwork right. in the packet right. and a picture of the wall at the end of the packet. Right. Um, what we're trying to obtain is uh, your approval for for this artwork, um, I can read through the whole packet if, yeah, if necessary. Sure. Is there anyone going to be here to talk? Not tonight. Okay. Not not at this meeting. I have one question, Les. Les yes, sir. What kind of paint can they put on there so you don't get the graffiti? Well. You know, I don't know that there's anything that is really graffiti proof, but I think this surface is probably going to be, um, they're going to put like a top coat or something on there, so that if anyone spray paints it, it probably will come off very easily. I you see. know, there, there's a lot of work that is going to be going into this 
Um, you know, the series of murals, and I'm sure that they, um, you know, were not wanting to have some random tagger ruin their their artwork. So I think it's probably going to be, uh, you know, just some kind of top coat that's going to make it easy to clean and, and get, you know, things like, like spray paint off of there. It's an anti-graffiti top coat so okay. they can take off the tagging and not damage the artwork. It's a very nice thing. Are you, are you done, Chris? I can be. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up the hearing and uh, <clears throat> some of the comments that I like to make is whenever you get young kids involved, young mm -hmm. boys and girls involved in a city project, it's a good thing. Uh, and when you can keep them occupied like that and come up with a design, like I see here that they have that design, I like that kind of stuff. Positive direction. Right, that's a positive direction for children here in Trinidad. Anybody else? Don't? No. I agree. I think, the, and, and you did state that the, the college is also kind of involved in this, so we're going to have a collaboration of students, students school, older students, high school working students with students and college. I agree. It's very good to get the kids involved. Yeah. And uh, okay, there ain't nobody here to talk about, and I think Mr. Mr. Downs kind of clued us in on what and what and what one of the main things are as far as that. If there's any other questions up here? I make a motion we approve this mural and send it forward. Have a motion. I'll second the motion. Motion made, second, that we approve the mural. These as it's been brought forward to us. Roll call. Uh, Armijo? Yes. Coker? Yes. Moderano? Yes. Nor uh, Spain? Yes, sir. Leone? Yes. Okay. Close the hearing. Thank you, Les. Thank you, Les. Thank you all. Thank okay. you, Les. Thank you, Les. Going on. Root, root policy, housing needs assessment report. Who's, who's here to give us that report? Uh, Molly? Hi, yes, I'm here. Can you all hear me and see me okay? Yes. Perfect. And I do have a presentation. Should I share my screen, or do you all have it on file and want to share from there? You just let me know if it's just for you. Go ahead. Um, should be able to. Oh, shoot. Okay, I want to make you the presenter. if you want to see it all right okay okay go ahead Um, where we are right now in the process is we've done the initial analysis, 
we are still analyzing some of our community engagement work, which includes a resident survey. Um, and then we will also be moving into system recommendations. So we're really close to kind of wrapping this project up, uh, but we're going to touch base with you on that to see if you have any questions on, on some of the existing data. Um, so I know uh, we, we have, um, uh, there's a lot of slides in here that, that have a lot of data on it. We'll be sharing the slide deck with you as well if you don't have it electronically already. We post it and get it to you. And then there's, of course, a, a more extensive res, uh, report that kind of goes through a lot of the findings as well. So I'm going to try to stay fairly high level well today, but feel free to, to bug me if I skip over something that you have know, a question about or if there's anything else you want to deeper dive on. I'm happy to do that. So uh, as an overview of what I'm hoping to cover, uh, we'll talk a little bit about demographics just for context. Um, uh, the housing market analysis. I'll also talk about projections uh, that relate to future housing needs. Talk briefly about some really cool preliminary data from the community survey, uh, and then I'll give you kind of our, our top housing needs identified so far as we um, uh, get to the end of the presentation. And of course, feel free to, to stop me, just interrupt me. I know it's hard for me to see you in a tiny little square. Screen. So I won't see you if you raise a hand, but, but please feel free to interrupt. I, I don't mind at all. So first, to just set some context around demographics. Um, you know, and I'm sure you are pretty familiar with your community, so I'll just kind of recap this uh, briefly as it relates to some of our work. Um, but uh, you know, there's a, a slight decline in the population between 2010 and 2020 in Trinidad. Um, kind of a slow and steady decline, as you can see in that top graphic, which is Trinidad specific. The lower graphic is looking at net migration at the county level. And essentially what this means is that, that your population decline has primarily been uh, people moving out um, of the county overall. That has really fluctuated along with um, uh, just economic shifts, so job losses. You know, you can see kind of a, a dive in the jobs in that bottom graphic uh, following the Great Recession. That's not a surprise. So there was kind of net migration out of the county after that. That had started to rise again. So we see people moving into the county over the past few years, but then COVID kind of put a pause on that as well. So hard to say exactly what will happen um, in, in the near term with that migration. Uh, though I will point out that the, the state demographer projects a continued decline in population, um, but, but there may be, I, I think there are, there's some reasons to think that that may not happen, particularly with the uh, potential employment and reopening of the mine as well. So a lot of factors kind of play into this. Um, as we think about future growth uh, for the city. Oops. There we go. In terms of age and household type, you know, obviously we think about this from a housing needs perspective because it drives what type of housing is likely to uh, to in demand in the community. Um, the share of seniors has risen over the past few years. That has primarily to do with kind of older village folks aging into what we call senior, which is 65 and older. You also had an increase in um, kind of young adult population, so those aged 20 to 34, which is a really strong indicator, um, both economically, but also from kind of a, a balance in terms of population profile. However, you are uh, losing sort of uh, family-aged, uh, or, or families with children, I should say. So a decline in the number of children overall, and that's impacting your student population in the school district as well. One more kind of socioeconomic factor, and then we'll jump into some housing specific data. Um, but median income has increased in Trinidad um, over the past, uh, you know, we're looking kind of 10 year span. And these graphics that you can see here, we're looking at that median household income. Uh, and and the, the graphic, uh, kind of the, the first one there, shows you Trinidad, Colorado, and the US. So a, a good increase in incomes in Trinidad, however, not quite as much of an increase as we saw statewide um, and nationally as well. Um, and poverty has overall uh, declined a bit, but poverty rates for seniors have gone up a bit. So uh, sort of a, a balance there. And, and then as you look at the great box in the bottom, you can see that um, you know even as we talk about some of those income increases, that, that was not the same for everyone. So certainly uh, owners had higher income increases than renters did. Um, and, and of course, owners tend to have higher incomes on average um, than renters as well. So those are just some, some socioeconomic data points to keep in mind in terms of the context uh, for housing, where, where the income kind of track really comes back into play is when we look at the change in housing prices and think about that relative to the change in incomes um, and how that affects overall affordability. So jumping into some of that housing market analysis, I know there's a lot this screen, but this, uh, this slide's a little bit busy. Um, it, it's 
mostly looking at just your existing housing housing stock. Um, so housing type by tenure, that means by renter and owner, um, as well as distribution of bedrooms. Uh, broadly speaking, um, you know, Trinidad has primarily single family homes, about 75%, 76% of those, uh, of all of our housing stock are made up of those. Owners are much more likely to live in that kind of housing stock than renters are. So when we look at the renter profile, uh, we start to see a lot more duplexes, triplexes, um, as well as uh, apartment buildings, uh, which is really typical. So a fairly standard um, you know, profile from that perspective uh, for a community uh, of similar size. Owner households are more likely to occupy units with, with more bedrooms as well, um, which is not terribly surprising. Um, so just thinking about kind of the balance um, of what's available and uh, what people are needing. I want to uh, kind of pause for a moment from the, the data on the housing stock just to kind of do a quick prior on area median income. Many of you may be familiar with this. It's very housing jargon specific, um, but generally speaking, AMI, when we think about housing, is sort of what determines qualification for housing programs, housing subsidies, um, any uh, housing dollars, basically, that, that are public dollars are going to be um, tied to these different AMI levels. So um, typical breaks are 30% AMI, which is generally around poverty level, um, 30 to 50, 50 to 80, and 80 to 120. So we are going to present some of the housing supply data in these AMI terms. So I just want to introduce it. I'm happy to answer specific questions about the um, if we need to as we get to it. So jumping back into some price trends on uh, rental price trends, this graphic is showing you um, two years of data, both by households by income level, as well as the rental units that would be affordable to them. When we say affordable, we mean um, spending about 30% of your income on housing. Um, so when we look at this share, the light blue is 2010, the dark blue is 2019. And the, uh, the bars on the left are showing you rental households. You can see renter households by income is fairly evenly distributed along these categories, going from less than $5,000 a year in income up to $75,000 or more. However, when we look at the rental units that are at um, price points uh, affordable to those income levels, you can see a real strong concentration of those, uh, those um, uh, uh, rental units. So, so renters by income are distributed fairly evenly, rental units are really concentrated. And that leads to a bit of a mismatch in the market which we kind of we quantify here in a different way, but looking at some of the same data. And the real key point here is that this analysis really is comparing that supply and demand by those price points. And what it's showing us is that there's essentially um, a shortage of units affordable to households that are in that zero to thirty percent AMI bracket. Um, you can see that there's um, across kind of the top line of this table, there's about six hundred and thirty renters um, that are in that income bracket. But there's only 480 rental units in that price point. This already takes into account any housing subsidies that are in use, vouchers, all of that is already accounted for. So this is a need above and beyond existing potential subsidies. Um, and it's about 146, um, what we call the rental gap of 146 units, meaning there's a shortage of units affordable at that price point. When we look at the, uh, a similar analysis from a uh, kind of sales perspective, in, in this analysis, we're looking at renters who might want to buy. So renters would be first time home buyers, essentially. Um, so it's all renters, but we're treating them as kind of our demand for potential first time home ownership. And then looking at the rental, or then, then the dark blue line is the single family sales. So sort of looking at, at where are our potential buyers by income, relative to where our potential purchase options uh, by income. So you can see we don't really see um, we're, we're kind of a mismatch, mismatch in those at the lower income levels. That's not at all surprising. You know, we don't typically anticipate um, you know having having a lot of ownership supply at those lowest income levels. You do honestly have a pretty strong supply in terms of the percentage of sales that were affordable to homes starting at about 25,000 or starting really at about that 25 to 35 thousand dollar price range so if you're a household that's earning 35 thousand dollars or more there are at least proportionally some options that doesn't mean the inventory is high enough for everyone uh, to find one but it does mean from a price point perspective there are some in that price range so i would say 
um, you know, in general, that's a that's a really good sign in terms of affordability for your market. However, we also see through some further analysis in, in the data that a lot of those at lower price points, a lot of those homes that are affordable at lower price points, also do require additional capital in order to uh, to make investments. So they may need significant repairs um, and remodels and, and that sort of thing as well. So there, there is some inventory that's affordable. Um, it, it may be limited in terms of actual number, even a proportional extent, and it may require some additional investment as well. This is a similar gaps analysis on, on the uh, for sale side. So similar to kind of what I was talking about in terms of those mismatches, but this puts it in terms of AMI again, as we talked about. Um, so here we're saying that we're looking kind of at that cumulative gap number. So when does the supply kind of catch up uh, to the demand? And that happens at about 50% AMI. You know, as we talked about, uh, or as I mentioned, there, you do have some, some really good signs in terms of affordability in your market. However, um, the, the, the rising prices of, of housing have exceeded the gains in income across the community. That does have, create some challenges in terms of uh, affordability uh, for some folks. Cost burden is one of the ways that we look at um, how well people are doing in terms of affording their housing costs. So cost burden means that you're spending more than 30% of your income on housing and severe cost burden means you're spending more than half of your income on housing. So in total in Trinidad, about 28%, so just over a quarter of owners are cost burden um, and nearly half of renters are cost burden, 45%. So, um, that again, it just kind of gives us a gauge. Cost burden of our renters did decline between 2010 and 2019, so that's a really good sign. Um, however, still 45%, um, you know, certainly is an indicator that there's still a need for some additional affordable housing, which we've talked about primarily in that 0 to 30% 30, 30 AMI um, bracket. I want to talk briefly about future housing need as well. So as we look at some of those needs that we've identified, um, and I know this is probably going to look pretty small on your screen, so I apologize for that, but I'll try to walk you through it a bit. Um, this table essentially looks at um, housing needs both now and in the future by income level. So across the top, it's talking about household earnings, uh, and kind of as you move left to right across the table, it's going from lower incomes up to higher incomes. Uh, also identifies for sort of the, the rent based on those those income levels and max home price um, and what types of housing are typically affordable um, to both renters and owners in those price uh, points. Once we get down to kind of the, the green bar across and the orange bars across as we're about midway through this table, uh, that's going to tell you kind of what, what we were talking about before, where are those existing housing gaps by price point. And as I mentioned, there's that gap at the lowest end on the rental market, so a need for additional subsidies there. On the higher end, um, there's a, uh, a need for, um, for uh, additional um, housing units to kind of spread out that, that concentration of, of housing in the middle price range. Um, we also looked at short-term rentals. So we, we essentially, when we scan the market for um, projecting needs, we said, is there any reason that you're losing housing inventory? Um, and in your case, there, you do have more short-term rentals now than you did 10 years ago, which is true almost everywhere. Uh, but so just accounting for those, you've had some inventory losses, almost 60 units that converted uh, from uh, kind of permanent resident occupancy into short-term rental occupancy. Um, and, and so acknowledging that there may be a need for additional inventory um, based on that. that. That's not to say that short-term rentals are, are uh, a detriment. They do bring in tourist activity, uh, they can generate revenue, but it's important to consider um, what's happening uh, kind of on the other side in terms of the housing availability as a result of those as well. Um, another uh, factor impacting future housing demand is the new all mine employment. So there's a projection that there will be about 200 new employees. We anticipate those to be um, fairly uh, higher earning employees. So in that probably you know, 50 to $70,000 uh, income range, so we assume that those additional units needed to accommodate the, that workforce is likely to be kind of at the higher end um, on the AMI spectrum. So at the very bottom, and this is kind of the, the bottom line, if you will, I suppose, um, is the estimated housing, future housing needs. And so acknowledging a need um, over the next uh, 10 to 20 years of uh, 31 for sale units and 100, um, or, or yeah, 31 uh, units for sale units in that kind of middle price point, and then some additional uh, units at the higher price point, um, and then an additional rental subsidy. So that's kind of that gap. It doesn't mean those folks are not housed, uh, but it means we need some, some additional subsidy or more affordable options at that lower price point as well. So I know it's a lot of data to throw at you. There's a lot more explanation for it, um, and, and we are um, happy, happy to answer questions, but essentially just kind of looking for it, and it's less, I, I think it's less critical to, um, to, 
to be able to perfectly pinpoint exactly how how much your population might change or how much it might grow, but to kind of acknowledge where's the balance and what types of housing we may need and at what price points to be kind of watching from that perspective to make sure um, that growth opportunities are accommodating kind of that full, full range of potential housing need. As I mentioned, we're still in the process of, the, of uh, analyzing the community survey that was out, um, and, and so I don't have the full uh, kind of data to share with you on that, uh, but want to just highlight a little bit about it. We got 166 responses that included both residents as well as in commuters. Um, and we ask unique questions to those groups so that we can take a look at maybe some of the differences and preferences there. Um, this kind of goes through some of the, um, the demographics and housing situations of those folks. So getting a fairly um, good representation of both owners and rents or renters. Um, those living in a precarious housing situation also typically includes renters, but it may also include folks that um, express that they were homeless or couch surfing or crashing with a friend um, at the moment as well. Um, the number, the proportion of living in single family detached is really similar to your overall market, so, so getting a representative sample there. I'll just want kind of one question that I always think is kind of interesting uh, in the survey analysis. So hopefully some of you took the survey and remember this question. But uh, in this question, we asked uh, folks that responded on a scale of one to nine, where nine means really important and one is not important. How important to you is it that Trinidad's housing supply includes these following types? Um, so, and, and this is asked more from a, uh, you know, kind of people in community composition perspective as opposed to a housing form perspective, but it's it's getting to kind of price points and housing types that accommodate different um, different phases of a life cycle or different components of a community. Um, and, and this is listed in order of kind of the average rating. So you can see at the top, the most important uh, on average was housing affordable to residents that are working in retail jobs like grocery stores. Um, followed by housing for middle class families, followed by housing of, housing affordable to residents on a fixed income like social security, starter homes for first time buyers, and then apartments or condos that appeal to young adults and working uh, working or starting families. So just a, just an interesting kind of uh, point to see what, what do people um, perceive to be the demand and where people's values in terms of kind of community development um, that, that accommodates a full life cycle of, of residents. And then finally, I just want to kind of give you kind of a recap of, of the top housing needs so far. Again, we're still analyzing some of that community data, um, so these could shift a bit. But from what we've seen so far, uh, both from the data and from talking to people, um, you know, we see a need for one or two bedroom rentals for workforce housing, as well as two or three bedroom ownership. Um, those bedroom numbers are based primarily on household sizes for those different tenures. Um, the, the primary ownership demand um, that we were seeing based on the current supplies in that 250 to $350,000 um, range. Uh, but we also see, you know, with the rise of the aging population, housing preferences tend to shift. And so as you continue to age, there may be a desire for uh, a more diverse types of housing. So that could include patio homes, so smaller yards, less maintenance, um, single level living, uh, as well as potentially condos uh, for, for the aging population. Uh, those that are looking to downsize, uh, or, or just downsize their, uh, their kind of maintenance obligations as well. As I mentioned before, in, in your most affordable uh, purchase properties, there is a need for rehab um, and modifications. So looking at um, you know, either sources or labor um, facilitation options uh, for rehab and modification. Um, we also see a demand for, as you, you're increasing kind of that, that young adult demographic, um, and and um, have some renters that are making more uh, and, and not a lot of rental units kind of at that um, higher end of the spectrum. So amenitized um, and modern rental properties do appear to be in demand as well. Um, land was a challenge as we talked to people as well. So land free of legal or environmental challenges in terms of development. And then as we talked about kind of that housing gap for rental down at the 30% AMI level. So looking at potential subsidized housing options for that group, um, you know, most commonly, that's going to be low-income housing tax credit um, development or something similar. Um, so uh, I'll just do a quick recap on next steps, uh, and then happy to answer any additional questions that you might have. But as I mentioned, we're doing some more analysis. Um, we're going to continue to develop kind of the final report and those recommendations. Um, we'll be working uh, with staff, um, and are also have been talking to some local stakeholders about some of those things, and we'll be in touch kind of with that final recommendations and report um, in the in the near future as well. 
So with that, I will stop talking and take any questions that you have. I can keep sharing my screen if there's something you want to jump back to, uh, but I'm also happy to stop sharing if that would be better. Um, yeah, if I could ask a question on the, on the your graphic with the factors imposing uh, future housing needs, um, and you, with, where you had uh, going across. I was looking at the the green bar where you were talking about um, the existing housing gaps, um, and it it looks like it's set up like uh, it's in a, a column. So that uh, if I'm reading it correctly, um, you're saying the Rental subsidies, the 200 rental, I'm looking at the far right hand side, middle of the page. Uh, 200 rental subsidies, 8% for sales subsidies. And that appears to be in the column for the, um, you know, the AMI of a, over 121%. Is, is that? Yeah, that is a good catch. I think that's actually, I don't think that it should actually be a subsidy. That has more to do with a price um, target on those, but not actually a subsidy. So I think what we're, what that should be saying is about there's, there's a, lot, a shortage kind of at the higher end in terms of price point, just acknowledging that there is demand uh, for some of those more amenitized options. But I think you're right to catch that that should not say subsidy uh, because it, it shouldn't actually be, you know, public dollars contributing to those higher price points. So if that was your question, um, I, I think you're right, and I think that's an error on, on our terminology right there. Okay, so looking at this graphic, then it says that basically if you lump those two, most of the needs that we have are in the high-end housing needs, um, with accounting for almost 300 people, and then at the low end of the housing gap, we've got just half of that. Is that what I'm, mm -hmm. am I reading your graphic correctly? I you, you are correct. I guess the, the only caveat that I might add to that is is um, when we have needs at the higher end, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean, um, I guess, this is, and there's kind of a fundamental difference in having needs at the low end. Those folks are sort of strapped. They are paying more than they need to, more than they kind of really can afford for housing. And so there's a little bit more kind of a, a financial uh, uh, element to that. On the higher end, that tells us that there is demand and the market could support higher cost um, rental units. However, at that price point, you also have a lot of renters that say, I will pay less than 30% than all my housing because I'm saving for a down payment on a house. And so you have a lot more at the higher end, you have a lot more folks that have a preference for renting down into those lower price points, even if they can afford something more. So I would say it's not as hard and fast of a number at the high end, but it does demonstrate support um, that there would be market support for uh, rental products that might come on that are priced a little higher than your existing rental products. Um, does that make sense as a caveat? It's a little bit squishy, but but you're you're reading it absolutely correctly. Um, I just want to kind of highlight here, there's a little bit of an inherent difference when you think about needs at the lower price points, and then when we think about kind of market uh, support at the higher end. Thank you. I have a question. So, your total survey you had 166 participants. That seems pretty low. Is that typical of the surveys to have a lower percentage of the population? Uh, great question. Uh, having a lower percent of the population is typical. So, our, our goal here is to get you know kind of a representation of, of residents. I mean, of course, if we got everybody to respond, that would be fantastic. I would love that. Um, it, it, it doesn't typically happen. Um, so we are typically looking for a fairly low percent uh, of respondents to uh, to complete the survey. That said, what we really look at more is are we getting representation from the different kind of segments of the population that we want to understand? So are we getting, um, you know, uh, some, some residents and some engineers? <clears throat> are we getting some homeowners and some renters? Are we getting kind of a variety of incomes? And, and, and so you know, it, as long as some of those things are lining up so that we can uh, get a little snapshot of those different uh, segments, then we're really happy. Um, I, I will say, I said this in a uh, city council meeting um, earlier today, and, and we'll acknowledge again, we are finding right now that kind of in this post-COVID, mostly digital world, um, we're actually getting lower response rates than we did probably three years ago. And, I mean, not dramatically lower, but I would have said probably three years ago I would have expected 200, maybe 250 responses in a community the size of Trinidad 
Um, and now I think this 150 to 175 is really, really typical. Um, I think there's just a lot of kind of fatigue, kind of uh, feedback fatigue. People are kind of checked out um, from some of these processes. I know you've also been doing some other, uh, you know, outreach and engagement. So it may be that the community has a little bit um, just kind of fatigue from responding. So I, I'd say, um, in general, this is pretty on par. Uh, I mean, of course, when we get more responses, we love that, but we still feel like we have plenty of responses to minimize kind of the error um, around those from a statistical perspective, and also enough responses that we really can draw some uh, some conclusions and at least capture um, some of the sentiment of folks um, in the community. I have a question for you. <clears throat> How was the survey conducted? Was it a phone survey? Uh a hard paper survey down at the Safeway over the internet, distributed through electric bills. How how was this done? Yeah, great question. So it was uh, an online survey um, that we, uh, or really the city, advertised through kind of existing partnerships, media, um, and uh, if um, I'm trying to remember, I, I was I was not quite as involved in direct, some of the direct outreach. And the city did a lot of promotional efforts through some of those venues where we had talked about including it in the utility bill. I honestly am not sure um, if that was part of the final outreach plan, but I can follow up. And I know we've got a little bit more detail um, in our report about some of the, the promotional efforts there as well. But it was it was an online survey. It was offered both English and Spanish. Um, we did take a few by phone as well, so we always have a phone number um, on our survey so people can call us if they'd rather take it by phone. We had a couple of folks do that as well. Um, we offered to make paper surveys available, but I don't think we have anybody use it uh, in paper form, um, just because it tends to be most convenient to do it online. The, the survey platform we use is really mobile friendly as well, so we had some flyers that were printed where people can kind of just scan one of those codes, um, QR codes, and then take it from there as well. I'm just concerned that your sample <clears throat> isn't big enough for our population, uh, and I don't think that you presented it accessible enough to our total population. You've, you've uh, focused in on the internet and users and the online users. Um, that's a younger generation uh, of people, and I don't I don't feel like that appropriately uh, communicates the people that live in our community. Um, I feel like a hard paper sample down at Walmart or down at Safeway or in the electric bill would give a better picture as to what's going on in our community uh, as a whole. That's all. Sure, point taken. Is this survey that you took, is it a general survey that you would take at other towns as far as our population? Um, I would say lots of the questions are, are kind of are general in that sense that you know we asked a lot of similar questions in different communities where we work, um, but it was tailored to Trinidad. So you know it, it was directed to Trinidad um, residents or workers. Um, you know some of the questions were tailored specifically uh, for Trinidad as well. So what what percentage, if you can answer the question, what percentage of the questions that went out went to our realty companies? Um, do you mean like how many respondents were yes. realtors? Yes. I don't know. Um, I don't think we asked that question. Um, we did. We do ask what industry, what industries people are working in. I can, uh, which I don't have right in front of me. I don't remember that being, you know, a, a disproportionate share. Um, but I, if you are interested as well, I can go back and follow up with. Um, uh, city staff that were involved in helping us promote the survey and talk to them about uh, get a little more detail on kind of the outlets where we promoted it um, and, and what networks they feel like were um, you know over, uh, were invested in that process or that we're sharing that and then I can also follow up um, and look at the industry profile as I say we're still analyzing some of that so we don't have all of it um, pulled yet but we do ask industry so we can take a look at, at how many may be in the real estate industry. When people, sorry, when people took the survey, is there any descriptiveness that says or that would say that they are uh, a Trinidad or you know county um, uh, uh, resident 
Thank you. <laughs> Resident or does you know if, could somebody in Miami Beach you know answer questions on that survey? And if they could, I mean, is there a way for you all to depict if that came from a resident or close to residents, a commuter, or if they came from someplace, you know, someplace else in the world? Right. I mean, we certainly ask people where where they live. We ask, um, you know, where people work as well. There's there's not a way for us to, um, you know, track back an IP address from where people were when they took the survey. So we don't, you know, regulate. And so if people are, are are lying on the survey, then then that is also possible. However, based on how we promote, you know, we're not like posting it on, um, you know, a, a widespread. Um, you know, geographically widespread advertisement. So it, it, my guess is that you don't have a lot of people in, you know, Miami taking it necessarily, but, um, but you know, we're, we're not, um, we're not regulating to that extent. So if folks are, are making up answers that just for the sake of taking the survey, then that's not something that we can track. Thank you. Um, I had another question. The, the short-term rentals were covered in, in uh, well, specifically in the section two document that, I guess the, the two word documents got compiled into the PDF. Is that how I, I did? There's two, the two yes, word doc. Yes. Okay, so, anyways, uh, so anyway, in, in terms of the um, short term rentals, it, we had we were rocking along at 50, 60 rentals, of, you know, two, 2019, 20, 21, staying right around 60 rentals, and then all of a sudden for 2022, 20, there's five. I, did you? That seemed odd to me, and then also I was wondering if, if, if those guys were affecting our shortages. The short term um, was totally. So I'll need to go back and look at that to see if that was new ones being added. I know we had one graphic in there. Um, uh, let's see, I can, I'm not sure how to unshare my screen to go back. I can look at the report, which is not a different It's figure 11. Um, point but then the one screen was showing was showing additional like new short term rentals, and so they were just a lot fewer that were added um, in that uh, time frame. We saw, and if that's the case, if it's the figure that's showing how many new ones there were each year, then that just means you may have either kind of hit a plateau in terms of adding new units. That doesn't mean the, the old ones are offline. It just means there's not new additional ones. That was pretty typical in 20 and 2020, uh, 2020 and 2021 um, during COVID. We saw. Um, for the most part, some people pulling them off, or not as many people adding um, to the to that inventory during some of the COVID um, elements, and so so that could explain part of it. I'd have to go back. Let me. Um, I can go back and take a look at that specific figure. Do you know what the figure number was on that? And I can take a quick look. It, it was figure eleven dash thirty seven. Okay. I will. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen so I can take a quick look at that. Um, and while I'm pulling that up, I'm happy to. Uh, um, answer any other questions too. I had another question. I, I just want to bring up again my concern uh, for the amount of people polled in the survey. Uh, estimating our population at 10,000, that's only 16% return. Uh, we, yeah, there you go. Uh, we are supposed to, first off, the city is supposed to be getting a value in this survey and you are presenting numbers that are supposed to be rock solid and I, I don't agree with that presentation at point zero six one six. yeah uh, people surveyed I mean y'all y'all agree that y'all 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 are marketing product here right and yeah don't you think that you should maybe do a better job at what you present is rock solid evidence. Um, I mean, sure. So, so I understand your concern and, and realize that, that you would like that to be higher. And to be clear, that is a small part of our scope. That is not that is not what all of these data are based on. That's just one uh, snapshot, and one way that we are engaging and, and getting some community feedback. So, most of the analysis that we're doing is based on uh, market data, demographic data, housing statistics. Um, and housing inventory, so that really is um, kind of the, the fundamental elements of our scope around those data pieces. I don't mean to minimize the importance of the survey, but I do want to clarify: um, you're not 
pay us to digital uh, to survey said. data either. Now, I do agree that it's an important yeah. element, and that we want to make sure that, that we're yeah. capturing that um, that perspective. Uh, I, I would say, uh, you know, this kind of survey is never meant to capture you know a huge portion of the population. It is meant to get some representative responses. Um, that said, if you all feel like you know that, that's insufficient, we could talk to. Um, you know, city staff about what, what would it look like to put that survey back out or expand that um, in the future or um, something to that extent. Uh, but uh, and, and we're open to that that conversation. And I, I hear your concern. Um, but, but that's not so, what you said. You said that you surveyed 166 people, and this were the findings. You didn't say that you surveyed 166 people, and then you added a whole bunch of other stuff, and this was the findings. You said that out of that survey, this is what you come up with, and this is what you're presenting to us as facts. And I just feel like that's being misled in the amount of people that were actually surveyed compared to the people that are part of our city. These are not these are not good numbers. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't believe these are good numbers at all. I believe that your way of doing this survey and the fact that you isolated it to the Internet, you... you <laughs> you, you, you're, you're a statistics person. I mean, you know what you've done. So, I mean, that's that's my concern. Sure, I, I have a big concern. I do, hear, I do just want to make sure that I'm clarifying. The, the only data that, that we presented that was from that survey was that very last question. So all of the previous data, the housing statistics, the socioeconomics, that's not based on our survey. That is based on census data, American communities data, um, housing statistics. So, so I, I just want to make sure, and I, I totally hear your concern on the survey. Only um, the last I, I question. Just want to that's not the bulk of the, the presentation. So only the last question was survey uh, material? Yes. Did yes, the rest is, is, uh, is public available data. Nobody um, on this board understood survey, that. So, so housing data. Nobody understood well, that, that only that last question was survey data. Everybody here thought that that entire survey was was what you was presenting to us. I honestly did understand it was the last three slides here. You did? I'm sorry, I apologize, he did. Uh, I, I did not understand that. I thought that, that what you were presenting was survey re return. Mm -hmm. I apologize. No problem, it, it, it's, still, it's still a valid, valid point. I just want to make sure we know where all the data are coming from, so. Tony? I don't have any. Norris? No? No, I'm good. Spain? Thank you. Thank good. you, Molly. John? Good. We're done. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Okay. I apologize for speaking. My bad. So, so. Yes, but of course, the, the two documents that are up there, because there's two Word documents, and then there's a PDF. And so you just put that up for, so we have more stuff to read. Was that on a presentation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was provided. Okay, okay, okay. good, good. But she didn't talk about that. Okay. Oh, wait, you get for extra. Okay, moving on. Uh, number seven, vetting of planning and zoning candidates. We got two candidates. Is uh, everybody read their resume? Yes. Uh, I'm going to ask each one of them to come up and want to give us a little bit more. And I think I'll start with Pat Hewitt. You want to come forward, please? You bet. Introduce yourself. And we got your <coughs> resume here. And maybe if you want to add to it or whatever, go ahead and do it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, uh, very, uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, good evening. Um, I think the the best way to start is why, why would somebody want to still in sport? Resumes are one of the things more of my past. Um, my past does include I've owned I've, I've been a real estate broker in, in two states uh, with real estate companies. I own a framing company that would be on there. You don't want to have multiple pages of things. I've been a mayor. I've been on a planning commission before. Uh, I've been uh, I've been with a housing authority before, and I've been in a town to where um, I think. It was further along with regards to change than any we're seeing here. And so why would I want to be on this commission? Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, what, what's in that presentation. Uh, I see displacement coming. 
I see flight of some of our youth. People that went to school here, Trinidad High School, people that went to Trinidad State College. I'm not so interested in making things so much better for people that are coming here now. There's reasons for people to come here. I've been here seven years this October. Uh, I brought my own, but I'm, I'm in good shape in my family. We're, we're good. Uh, we walked through buildings when we came into town because they're really affordable. Um, I have five units out there, and we've done um, rent uh, deposits assistance. We've had a lot of times during COVID where somebody couldn't pay for a long period of time. We've had a lot of times where somebody is couch surfing in our units. That at least says one thing, but your heart says that maybe you do, it, do things a little differently. I believe there are solutions. I believe there are opportunities. But the main thing I look at is um, our, our seniors. I actually believe when we did additional dwelling units up in Frazier Winter Park area in Grand County, it, it didn't seem like that would be the folks that actually were benefited the most. But we had seniors that actually owned property in Frazier Winter Park for decades. It's in the family for a long period of time. They had wealth, but only if they sold their home. But they were on fixed incomes. There was no way for them to get any more money. And so we made additional dwelling units available, sometimes called accessory dwelling units. It wasn't so much for investors or those folks who were going to do that stuff, for decoupled properties. Somebody, because our housing market had accelerated so much, they finally had money, pretty similar to Trinidad. For a long time, you couldn't get a loan to fix up your house because you may not have had equity enough in your house to get that loan. Well, so what, what we found is a lot of seniors were able to take that garage in the back or take some part of their property and put an apartment in there and rent it to a ski bum or rent it to a family member or rent, and they were able to get added income. So they were properly rich or had property wealth, but they were income poor on a, on a fixed income. And so for me, a lot of the challenges that, are, that came from that, not just the survey, I, I have questions with regards to the survey myself, so Chris, I, I understand and appreciate that. I think all the other data is real data. And some of the things that I look at, and it came from a 2019 uh, local study, is uh, Trinidad's median income um, in the 2019, $37,196, $37,000. Um, three quarters of our population earns less than $25,000. These are, pe these are people in Trinidad right now. People that are coming here are bringing bigger incomes. And they're, they're, and they're going to displace the folks from Trinidad. And we have a saying up in Mountain Towns is that you'll end up living down valley. Well, there is no down valley from here. If you can't really afford here in Trinidad, we don't make things affordable in Trinidad. I don't know where people go. Where do our seniors go? Where are the folks that actually come here go? So, um, I actually, you know, if, if you start looking at median rent, it was 925 this is back into, you'd have to be a family earning $33,300, but we already know that a quarter of our population makes $25,000. So why would I want to sit here? I think, I think we can do, I think we can help. I think we can make it to work. We can use code, and we can use um, incentives, and we can use um, the things that we have if you look around Trinidad, Trinidad has figured out how to do things over the decades. And so I think, I think I'd like to be a part of that. I think uh, I have no uh, conflicts of interest. There's nothing that I'm doing that absolutely would be affected uh, by this board. I'm not in real estate. I have no benefit from it at all. I have my, I, I, I have my own, I make my own living mostly outside. I have a little tidbits paper if anybody reads that, but that was done mainly to help local businesses have something affordable to be able to market themselves, because I'm, I'm a localist. So, <clears throat> uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a hard worker. Uh, I will read everything that comes plus. I will dig deep. Um, I will never, never be unprepared. And I will always, always provide uh, honest, ethical uh, input. I can work with everyone and anyone. Um, and so, um, I appreciate this, and if the answer is no, then I've, I've got a good life to go back to, but I'd really like to spend the next couple of years of my life uh, having a beneficial um, input and making a deposit into the Trinidad Bank. So I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you for your Thank you. Uh, Our other <coughs> candidate is Danelle Rule. Do you want to come forward? So I'm Danelle Rule. I'm the 
So I did not give you a resume. I didn't know that was required. I just filled out a quick application for you. Um, but to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I'm a real estate broker, which I see as a benefit, not a detriment. Um, I have been a broker here since 1997. I, my husband and I raised our children here. Um, I've been vested in this community. I love this community. And I feel like I could serve um, the knowledge that I have in real estate, I think is beneficial to this board. And that's why I want to serve. I understand you're fifth generation according to your resident here. Yes. Fifth generation? Yes, sir. And so you've been in Trinidad a long time. Yes. And uh, I wasn't if raised you want to add anything, anything you can. Um, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, I feel that the changes that are happening in Trinidad are good. And I don't have a lot to go on like what he was saying, but I feel like what this commission does, my experiences in the real estate world would be beneficial to this community and this board. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Danielle would be an outstanding member of that board. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to poll the board and I'm going to tell you two candidates why. We never have had, as long as I've been here, as chairperson or vice chair, we never have had two or three people applying for one job. <laughs> it's only been one person, and we just took their resume, listened to them, and sent it to city council. But means that we have two, and uh, I kind of checked with uh, Les Downs before the meeting, and he said we can do this one of two ways. So I'm going to vent the board here. We can take what they told you tonight, plus their resumes, and we can table it until the next meeting and come back and vote on it the next meeting. Or, staff has got some ballots here. We can vote on it tonight with the ballots, on paper. So, I'm leaving it up to the board, whatever way you want to go. If somebody wants to make a motion to table it and come back at the next meeting and vote on it, or if you want to do it tonight, and that way they're prepared, because some of them had heard, they both heard what was presented to us tonight. So it's up to the board. However you want to do it, guys. I make a motion to do it tonight. Yeah, I don't see an advantage to to. Okay. Postpone it, so do I have a second? Se I'll second. Motion made, second. We do the application tonight. Okay, uh, Victor, you want to come pass these up? Sure. Before he reads these out, I'd like to tell the two people that apply for the job, whoever gets it or whoever is second or however you want to put it, I'd like you to keep your name on there for future. So people, because we always have sometimes something happens that a person can't stay on the board, they move out of town. We had two of them that moved out of town. You have to live in Trinidad. They moved out of town and they left the board. And at that time there, uh, there was one that was sick. So we very seldom had a forum. It's tough to keep a forum. So I like whoever does not get there tonight to keep their name on board. Appreciate it. Keep their name in the, in the city. Thanks, sir. 
All right. Go ahead, Victor. So it looks like Miss Rollo got the most votes. Okay. I think that's an outstanding. And now, thank you. thank you for coming. Thank you for putting your name in. Pat, appreciate you putting your name in. Keep appreciate it there. It. Appreciate all of you guys. Keep it there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Discussion of ADUs and the division of low density residential units. And I think, uh, Chris, you want to start this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, Gentlemen, ladies, I, I, I do apologize for any trouble or any misunderstanding that I may have caused. Uh, but I requested that this get put on our agenda for this evening. Um, and the reason why I did that uh, wasn't to try and sway uh, our policy one way or the other or to change code or anything like that. The reason why I did it was because I'm interested in knowing how we stand as a board. Uh, how do we feel? I mean, we know how we felt whenever we were being pressured to make a choice, to make decisions uh, just a little while ago, but the truth is we've never, just as a board, decided how we felt about this because I personally think that in the low density residential, I think that whenever we are speaking about this topic, I think that the additional dwelling unit is the wrong terminology to use because I think that if you look at those areas you'll find that most of those owners have built such big homes that the percentage of block coverage would prevent them from building any other structure on their lot it's just too big there's not going to be able to be a second building on that lot so what we're actually referring to whenever we're speaking about the low density residential and the additional dwelling is we're speaking about dividing those big homes up into a bed and breakfast or over there by the the college we're speaking about maybe one of those homes becoming a sorority house or something like that for college students so are we as a board saying that we believe that those owners don't have the right to create a bed and breakfast you know are we saying that we want those completely out of our city? Are we saying that we don't want our college to grow to someday include sororities? I don't believe that. I believe that if we look down the road, we all want those things to come to our city. Uh, we want more housing. We want to turn our city towards tourism. And bed and breakfasts are some of that way. I mean, this is a way for us to expand our city into the new direction that we're going into. And I believe that we as a board should sit down and, and speak about this more. Uh, you know, because there are other ways of dealing with this than just limiting it and killing it out. You know, we could take and we could set this up to where a percentage of neighborhood residents that are in the certain area of the home have to agree with the bed and breakfast being there. You know, we can talk about parking and all of that stuff once we agree that we want to move forward. But with us just saying no, you know, I was I was locked up on the idea of building another building in the middle of all these other buildings. And now we got too many buildings. And it occurred to me that that's not what we're speaking about at all. What we're speaking about is a big house being divided in half so that two families can occupy that space instead of one. And if the aesthetics of the neighborhood aren't changing, the look of the building isn't changing, then then I don't know that we have a say so. You know, I feel like owner rights should prevail. So that is why I ask that we speak about it, is we see the other side of things and we look at the reality of what we're dealing with in this low density residential because I just don't think that the opportunity ex is there for a lot of other law homes with the code written as it is. I think that what we're talking about is dividing one or two of those homes into multifamily units. And, you know, to be honest with you, I don't think that would be such a bad idea. Uh, and, you know, I mean, Whenever we do go down the road of the bed and breakfast, <clears throat> how can we say that you can't allow a multifamily dwelling in a historical district because 
if you're going to have a bed and breakfast, that's the place they want to be. They want to live in those old houses. They want to have those nice places to go to because that's the draw. You know, nobody nobody wants to go to a bed and breakfast that's an apartment. So, you know, if, if it is in fact our job to help guide Trinidad and where we're going and tourism is where we need to be. And I feel like we have to do something differently on this and at least get the city uh, council to speak on this and start to open this up so that we can develop that tourism. That's all I got. Thank you guys. Well, we, we uh, as a board, people are here tonight know that we've been on these ADUs for, mm -hmm. for three or four months now. Mm -hmm. And we never, each of us has their own idea of an ADU, accessory dwelling unit. And uh, we all had some good ideas, but when we brought them up, it seemed like they were thrown out. Yep. None, of our, none of us up here, every one of us had an idea. But our ideas were no good because the person that was in charge here, how can I say, had a different idea. And we all had good ideas. Uh, some of them that were some of them were brought up at that time. It said, I forget who brought it up here. They said, do more MDRs. Stay away from single dwelling units. Somebody brought that up. I don't know who it was. Which makes sense. I was here when we did the comprehensive plan. 18 months. We did a comprehensive plan. And we're a planning and zoning. That's what we are. And during that 18 months, we went back and forth. We met with city council. City council didn't like some of the stuff. We went back and changed it. That's when Tara Marshall was here. We came back and they accepted it. We all sat here one night and they accepted it. And in that, in that comprehensive plan, in the orange area, there's an area for ADUs. Mm -hmm. But there's a window they got to catch. They got to do that window. And it seemed like to me, whenever we brought that up, the window wasn't even brought up. Window and whenever you, size. whenever you, whenever you start doing that in a low dense residential, this is my opinion. You communitize the property. You communitize it. You lower the property values of the neighborhood. That's what you're doing. I disagree. I disagree with that wholeheartedly. And we've got okay, okay, hang lots on. I'll, of. I'll let you talk. I'll let you talk. And uh, yes, they have a right. There's a right. That person has a right, but the other person has a right too. <coughs> and when you start changing the name, the nature of the community, the hysterical nature of the culture of the neighborhood goes away. And Mr. Norris, it's yours. Okay. Um, Thank you, sir. Um, I think that um, yeah. planning and zoning has been set up and historically has been set up to impede growth. And it's been very effective at that. It has, um, through redlining, I mean, we have kept, um, we've kept, you know, in, in different communities of color in certain areas, we've done certain things. I mean, and I, all of, a lot of that has been done through planning and zoning. Um, right now we're getting these accessory dwelling units um, are um, a way to um, let individuals and let the community grow and develop. And it's, it's a way that it lets the community grow and develop economically. It's, it's far cheaper to develop and have higher density in, inside the walking distance of the city than to go and do another stupid subdivision out there, Cougars Canyon, wherever, you know, I mean, that's the dumbest thing you can do is put um, a housing development where, because you got to build roads out there, then you got to support the roads, all that stuff. So um, us allowing to, we're allowing people inside the city to develop more, the property value is going to go up. I mean, if you, you know, if you have one lot and you have two two house two dwelling units on it, each dwelling unit can get 
you could if you could sell them separately, you would get more money for them separately than you would together. Um, but that one piece of property with both houses on it is more valuable than your neighbor who just has one house on it. I mean, and so um, you are increasing value, and and so. Um, I don't know. I, that's. I, I mean, if we allow people to develop, then they will be able to increase value, and they will be able to better themselves in the city. That's kind of just ADUs in a nutshell. So, um, I don't. The, the fallacy of the single family dwelling is is one that we've been with um, since World War Two, and and it's it's developing on, and it's it's. Leading, it's got terrible patterns of growth if you look at different parts of the country. And Trinidad's been able to weather some of that because of, um, you know, use the sustained boom and bust years and all that. And and so we're developed. We have a, a great little jewel of a city and just let it develop, let it live. And, and we're standing in the way of that with zoning stuff. So if we can just relax some of that and you know, go with the intent, which we want it to be a beautiful place. So, you know, come back if we, we want to address aesthetics, aesthetics, you know, address them, address the aesthetics. Don't do it trying to, with setbacks or roof pitch or this or that. I mean, come out and say what you want. You know, if you, if you don't want people there, then don't let them be there. But if, you know, we want to build houses and build a city, let's build a city. Are you done? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I have a Anybody else? So the very, those variances alone, you can do the ADU. Nobody say that you cannot do the ADU. But I'm in with the board within the past I don't know, five, six months, maybe. How many people have asked for a variance for an ADU in the past several years? Uh, so uh, we're looking at something that don't uh, How much does it cost to come up and ask that question? Yeah, let's ask that question. That's how much does it cost to come up? Cost seven hundred and fifty bucks just to sit in that chair. So how would you solve it by doing a blanket? You can just do whatever you want. Well, I mean, so so I mean, twelve hundred. Twelve hundred. We, we, we have hundred. We have hundred twenty-one pages of of. Uh, this is a survey and analysis and land use critique that we've been working on, um, but I mean. So if we go through and we start looking at, okay, so what are the things that we, you know, I mean, there may be some places that you just flat out can't put, you can't put them in. No. And that would be the, you know, a, although it's screwing the people that live up there, but the nice neighborhoods that have the big single family dwelling, they, it would be in their interest if they could put in an ADU. But we're, if we say that they can't do that, we can protect them and... We can protect them from themselves and and you not know, let that happen. But it goes back to two. Got to think of uh, the parking. You brought it up yourself at one of the meetings. This is a big deal. That's a big deal. I, I and 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 I have been my view on parking. I, I I agree with that. And and I've been. I was reading through some of this stuff. Apparently, we don't have a parking problem because if you only have to walk a block or two, that's not a problem. Um, you know, I mean, that, that's a choice. You know, my, my son was just, he's been traveling around. He's in Sedona. And uh, Sedona's a beautiful little town in Arizona, gorgeous red rocks. But it is just overrun with the with tourists. I mean, you cannot get, you can't get to the, 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 the streets are overrun. The stores are overrun. The restaurants are overrun. I mean, there's just people everywhere. No place to park. And, and um, I mean, he had to, he parked in a horse trailer parking because that, was a cheaper ticket than, you know, um, whatever. But we, we, we don't want that. So, I mean, parking is an issue, but we do need to allow our, our, our people to, to grow and develop because we do have a significantly, we have a significant population that we basically need to look out after. And, and ADUs are one way that we can do that. And we can help them help themselves. And, and so, yeah, that's... Can I ask another question? Go ahead. Why does it cost $1,200? Years ago, when we had our, when Gabe England was here, he, well, we also have, we're paying for carrying the pool. 
So we had a consultant. Is this still being still happening? No. So why it, it's 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 a, it's a, it hasn't been addressed. No. It needs to be addressed. I think it's way. People are a good place to start. People are scared to come up and apply because they're taking a risk of losing twelve hundred fifty dollars or a variance or. That's a lot of money to a lot of people. Who would address that? Who would look at the city council? Would have to look at that. To me, that seems like a good place to start. Yeah, we should pass a motion or send a motion up to have city council look at it. Mr. Myron, you know, I, I believe that we've had an ADU in place for many, many, many years. Okay, it's, it's not brand new. It's it's been there. That window's been there. There's there's a there's a few things that we have to change because it contradicts each other, okay? Like for instance, the water uh, uh, meters, uh, utility meters. Uh, one of them says uh, it doesn't have to be, it could be just on one, and then the other one says, yes, you have to have them separate. We could fix them things, okay? And as far as money-wise, we could fix that too. You know, if a guy brings in an application, and we have to look at it. I don't even know if we even have to charge him to start with, but if he ends up doing it, then he has to pay for it. And if he wants a variance, sure. that's right. You know, I, I think, I, I don't think what, what we're talking about is impossible, no, sir. You know, I, I mean, we don't have to, we don't have to get to the point where uh, it's parking or this, that. The, the, the code that we have right now addresses each and everything. Right. We don't. It addresses the parking. It addresses the setback. It addresses the roof pitch. It addresses all the situation. We don't need to have another uh, AUD. All we need to do is to address the one we have. I agree because yeah. I think one one of the parts of this that even in the beginning when we were talking about was I assumed. ADU, right? Accessory dwelling unit was something that was going to be built, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's not that way. So an ADU is, is basically three different things, correct? It's about three, yeah. Yeah, so it is a, a separate building. It's maybe something that you've taken and you garage made your garage into a place, or you've taken, you've taken, you split your house in half and you made another. And, and so some rules can apply. You know, like, so when you get into, well, your lot's got to be this big and da 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 Sure, it should if you're going to build something on it. But does that same rule apply if you're going to take your garage and, and finish it? Or, or if you're going to split your house in half? That, to me, some of them rules don't, they don't go hand in hand. You know, I have a suggestion. Maybe the, the second step after working on these uh, prices, uh, maybe what Mr. Monterado said, uh, to not have them pay for it unless it's, it gets granted. Uh, but maybe the second step to that is defining these three different structures and understanding that they're not the same, that they're not all, they can't all be regulated the same, the same rules can't apply. So perhaps we need to divide these into three different subsets. In, 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 in some way, yeah. But, and, and I agree with you 100%. We do have a plan, you know, there is a, a plan out there that we are to follow. There is an area that this can happen. Um, I've been here for, I think this is my second second term, and I can't remember one time that anybody has come to us in any way, shape, or form, in, in, even in an area that it's allowed. So maybe we need to, my opinion is maybe we should address some other issues first before we try to change the wheel. I think even even with the, even with the take of parts, partials of your own home, like a basement or an upstairs, and you change it into a, a rail. I don't even think it has to come to us. I don't think that even has to come to us. But it's it, that's how they're listed in there. They are listed, at the ADU is listed as three it's, different Yeah, it's going to be, it didn't have to come to us as yeah. an ADU. That's what I'm saying, if we split this I, up I, into different categories. I, I agree with you, but the stuff like that have we, have, we have one, all we have to do is, is correct what we need to correct. And I think as far as the price, I I, I, I'm, I, I think we ought to just drop the price unless you're going to do it. Yep. Could we? Well, you see, when that comes down to it, Victor, you probably have 
all the time staff has to staff has, yeah staff has to staff has a lot payments. of time yeah. somehow we have to well, we have subsidize to, that cost right yeah. we, we should have to make a motion to send uh, something up to city council to get them to start looking at this price and seeing how we can reduce this price and make it more user friendly yeah we can do that this would be a good step could we also let the city council know that we are working on this with i mean i think we've made a lot of ground tonight just over this little bit of talking that we've done more this is more talking than the last four months entire four months yeah I mean, I'm really proud of us for what we've accomplished today. This is us working as a board. And this is why I, I asked to have this done. It's because I know we can do this. And we can better this city. I know we can. Uh, we've got some good members. Do you want to make a motion to um, maybe look sure. into those prices? and find Make a vote, yeah, go ahead. How do you want to make the motion? For research or to maybe possibly cost comparison. Uh, Research reduce. <laughs> <laughs> you should put it some way that that the city staff, you know, they have to do their diligence. Uh, oh, and it costs it costs money. Yeah. So let, let, me, let me say this: the city is looking at a way to promote housing. Exactly. Okay. And if they have to put in some cost, I don't think it should hurt them at all. So, so maybe sure. some we type of, of incentive. Huh? Some type of incentive, maybe. Maybe a, waiting, waiting maybe a, a scholarship program. People can apply for some of the MMJ money and cover some of the cost of this application. This one be well, that that difficult. I agree, but they, I don't know. If they want housing, they want this to happen. This is government. First step of the first barrier, which is a big chunk of money just throw out there to see what happens. Yeah. So maybe they do it in a way that if it goes through and everything's approved, then they pay the money. Okay, we could do that. We could look into that. I could tell. I don't think twelve hundred dollars. Wait, that's way. That's so much time. Cool. That's back whenever we was paying for mm -hmm. Mrs. McCool as well. She's gone now. It's just the the cost has never right. been adjusted. adjusted. So I think that we can we can definitely work on it. It should it should come down quite a bit. Was that was that were the costs ever addressed with you guys at the time? Uh, that came straight from city staff. I didn't ever have anything. I can remember. It's been forever. Okay, I'll look into that tomorrow. So do we make a motion? You can, yeah. Okay. How do you want your motion to read? This is a planning and zoning uh, commission Just cost. recommends that the city look into the onward or not eva evaluate. Just evaluate, evaluate the, the right. cost structure. The cost structure for the for the planning, planning application. Well, how would you work if you say that you just want them? for the charge until it's approved. We don't pay until oh. it's approved. Charge and payable also, on options. Options. If it, it, it can, can be an option. Who cares? Right. Can we do yeah, this? Exactly. Can we if do the this? city takes off and well, start building. Right. Isn't that what we want? Yes. Yeah. I mean, man, did you see her projected numbers? 31 projected homes built over the next 10 years. How many? 31 was what that number said, right? That's terrible. So that's that's terrible. That's three houses a year. And the demographics. <laughs> that's were terrible. But that's you know, the need. I don't know. Well, that's, that's right. That's the, the need. survey. We have to the survey was it. The survey was, yeah. But because I can tell you right we now. Got to, we got to jumpstart this. I can tell you right now. And I won't put her on the spot. You know, I think Mrs. Yeah. Rollo can tell us. <laughs> I know a that. contractor right now that will be building five houses this year. Sweet. Five. That's one is. contractor. Oh, what about what about T Tony Pierdisa and that guy that's going yeah. to build all them condos mm -hmm. or towns so, or whatever? The survey that, that was brought to us tonight was like you were saying, and, and I'll tell you, it's not just one one percent. That's a one back, little over one percent. That's my math was wrong. Back in 1980. Now a lot of people don't understand about 1980, but <laughs> 1980. The interest rates went to 17%. I built the house in 1980. Okay. My loan was Century, Lane, uh, Century Savings and Loan was 17% interest. How many people were capable of building a house then? There wasn't very many. We're back into that same situation. The cost 
is prohibiting people from building. The interest rates at that time prevented people from building. It will go away, I guarantee you. Yes. Free enterprise will make things happen. This is true. That's a good way of looking at it. Thank you. Okay, guys. Anybody else want to inject anything into it? We, we, yeah, need, we, we need to vote motion. on the motion. Go ahead. Yeah, we got to vote on the motion. Okay. You want to read it? Thank uh, you. To evaluate, uh, evaluate cost structure, right? Yeah. For change approval. And make it payable upon completion oh, yeah. of the variance. Okay. Or, or upon that? approval. Do I have a second? Uh, upon approval. Yeah, I'll, I'll second it. Vote, oh, make sure made by John. Second by Chris Bain. Roll call. Armijo. Yes. Coker. Yes. Moderano. Yes. Norris. Yes. Spain. Yes. Naomi. Yes. Man, that's a good work we got done tonight. Okay. Good job. Uh, yeah. Next is uh, the chairman's report. Uh, I have no report at this time. Uh, commissioner's report. This is yours. Norris. Norris. I'm good. Sam. Um, well, let me think on that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Mr. Marano. I don't have it. John? Nothing. Chris? Uh, I'm good. Uh, I would just like to add uh, new business for next meeting. I would like us to take up the uh, discussion of consumption clubs. What? I would like that to oh, put on, uh, on the agenda for next meeting. Oh. Uh, just discussion? Yes, discussion and maybe dividing it up into different categories so that it is not a blanket. Wow, I would, I, I do have one thing. Now, I'm not sure. So I went to a uh, convention this last week. And the talk throughout the convention is so when we look at, you know, up north, there's communities towns and they're offering huge incentives because as we all know the way the world is going there's all this big push for for green kind of going power right so i can tell you right now there's there's towns up north that will not issue gas taps for people that are building housing and we're talking these are very large dynamic areas they are not allowing gas taps everything is all power Okay, which means it's bringing in, you know, for a guy, you know, in HVAC, it's going to be dealing with heat pumps and whatnot. For plumbers, there's actually ways to deal with the, 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 the um, heating hot water through heat pumps. So that's what there's a big push. Now what's going on here is you're getting companies like San Isabel, right? So San Isabel, um, Howard, all, all those places, Black Hills, a lot of these companies, and it's, it started, it started in Pueblo, they're starting to do this, but they're, the cities or these, these companies and sometimes these townships are, are allowing big incentives for when people start to do this. So my question is, I haven't heard a single word about any of that happening around here. I also understand that our power grid is a dinosaur and we have issues there. But... Being an energy guy, I also understand that some of this equipment that's getting put in doesn't draw as many amps and whatnot as some of our older equipment. So, is it a benefit for our, for our community to start looking into this? We've we've talked about it for as long as I've been up on the board. We've talked about where our issues are with water. We've got a big hole up there that needs to be fixed. It's going to cost this many million. Da 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 da. We know we have a, a power grid that is is kind of dilapidated. Um, but with growth, we're talking about building houses, right? Well, guess what also is going to come into play with that? we got power. Infrastructure. Right? Exactly. Infrastructure. So, you know, here we go. So if it's already going to start up north, it's going to trickle down this way. It's going to happen. Is there, is, is there any talk in the city? Because um, we know that they buy power. They, you know, they buy power. So are they working with any of these entities to see what they can do to offer the community or builders or whatnot incentives to build certain types of homes whether that be all electric you know I'm not quite sure what the what to say but if we're offering incentive there's places I've got some good good data I didn't bring it with me but I've got some really good data there's places that are offering 
homeowners like $15,000 to go with an all electric house dealing with high end heat pumps and all that. So they're giving that to a homeowner. That's a great incentive. That's a huge, most of the time, you might be able to go to San Isabel and let's say they throw in a little heat pump system in there and they're gonna get mm, an $800 tax credit. Well, for an, an owner, that's that's a great that's a great benefit. Well, San Isabel will give you, if you go all electric, San Isabel will give you a break. Okay, but now we're, let's talk about the Trinidad. That's where I'm. That's what I'm trying to get at. Because even out there, I don't hear much talk outside these skirts with, with people going with more energy friendly equipment or whatnot. I don't. I haven't heard of many many of that happening around here. I definitely haven't heard any of that in the city. And I think that's what I'm trying to get at is should should we start looking at infrastructure? Should we start looking at ways that we can provide provide builders or or uh, investors, whatever, uh, ways to bring, we need to bring this to the table because it is the future. It's happening. It's happening now. It's up in Denver. It's in these big, it's going to trickle down. It's inevitable. I've just got a legal question. How can we, how can we offer an incentive to take gas out of the home and pretty much discriminate against a company that's in our town, the propane people, without having legal ramifications for putting them out of business. Yeah, no, that, them out that's of business. not what they're asking. They're not asking. What they're asking is that all new building. Yeah, I understand, but we're still offering money to not let them put propane. You in still have an house. option whether you you don't have to take that, but you might get that incentive. It's not about putting anybody out of business okay. because at the end of the day, every everybody has their own choice. It's it's an incentive. So. You want to pay gas? Pay gas. And but there's some some of some of these homes. It's, it's almost in, it's almost prohibited for anybody to change an old house into a hundred percent electricity because, like you just said, the new units have less amps. Mm -hmm. You know, start but with the old amps. I was trying to do one in a house. I was going to go all electric. Okay. The box would be. The, the, the box, the, the electrical box, everything that you put together with that thing was so enormous. And it was something like $3,500 just for that. Because it, it, all the power that you would have to draw with that old equipment, it, it just made it prohibited. Okay, but with the new stuff, I'm, I, I, I can see that happening. For sure, and that's what, that's what, kind of what this is all leading around. It's not, it, this is not gonna be for everyone. Right. Because, you know, to build that kind of house, you know, to build a house in general, it's expensive. Now you try to build a, because you, what you're talking about is energy. Mm -hmm. That's at the end of the day, that's what this all boils down to is energy. Okay. And so, there, again, it's happening. This, this is, it's happening. It's going it's to trickle down this way. I just think instead of waiting we need to start looking at this sooner rather than later because it's it's gonna it's gonna come it's 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 the inevitable it's happening maybe uh uh Victor, we could get some why well, why don't you bring some of your information to us yeah i will we'll put it on next meeting yeah we'll, we'll bring some of your information we just discussion yeah well I'll, I'll get a hold of some guys and i'll have them send me stuff but just what's happening just in our state i'm, I'm, gonna, be, I'm not no, gonna venture I'm anywhere else i'm gonna venture state there's small towns that are doing this um if i remember correctly um, right before COVID, and, and I'm going to talk about New Mexico for a second. So, so uh, there's a ski town down there. What is that? Taos. Uh, Taos. Taos. Yeah, I'm Taos. Taos. Thank you. Taos. Taos. So Taos was trying to make that little town anything that was going to get built there. I had so we had there was people get with it such an influx of calls because the town was saying we're going all electric. We're going all electric. Mm -hmm. No more gas caps. No more of this. That was that was happening a few years back down in Taos. There was an influx of that happening. Where it went, I don't know, because that's down there, I'm here. This is what my concern is. But I do know a few years back that was happening down in, in Taos. Now, now after my meeting last week and being up at the convention and hearing what's literally happening up north in the state of Colorado, and it's not just in Colorado, there's places out in California. I've, I've met with a group of guys that are working in Wyoming, Colorado, California, you know, there's just they're covering a large dynamic area because this is what's happening. 
So electricity. Banking. I believe it's something. I mean, I just think it's it's smart for the city to look into this stuff now rather than later. Because if there's ways that we can start, I don't know what's, what's going on with the, with the infrastructure on, on our power, but we want to make this town grow. Guess what? Infrastructure. Infrastructure's going to have to grow. So you'll send some stuff over to us. So I will get yeah. some stuff. Yeah. Cool. That'd be great. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that is only direct report. I guess we don't have one. I'll be no. Careful. <laughs> okay. We're on the hunt. Okay. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll right. second. Let's roll call. <laughs> Chris? Uh, yeah. is no longer being recorded. Yes. Uh, it's our Mijo. Okay. <laughs> are we going to do a roll yes. call? Or are we Adjourn yes. Adjournment. Yes. Okay. Are we, are yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Yep. Yes, yes sir. Adjourn. <laughs> Just that. Just, just, and we did great tonight. Is that we did? It's a great meeting. Well, I think they're going to work out great. Thank you. 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 Thank you.